Yeah. Um, my son in law called. He was playing golf this uh -huh. morning. Uh -huh. It's 9 My daughter's in this one this morning. She's eight months pregnant. She took her dog for a walk in the park. Uh -huh. The dog came home with just a leash on. So the dog came back without your daughter? Right. Okay, what is your address, sister? Well, I'm a. Is that where, is that where she's No, so it's over at the Loma Park is where she went for the walk. What's your cell phone number, sir, in case you get disconnected? It's, um, um, 404. Uh-huh. Uh, Jesus, I can't believe I'm going to go for it. 404. Okay, so what's the address where she lives and she's missing five? Her address is... Another between Encina and Edgeworth Drive? Yeah. Okay, is that a house in a... What is your name? My name is Ron. I'm her... Okay, what is your name? Hi, it's me, Vicky Marie, and today we're going to talk about another case that I think is very similar to the Nicola Bully case, the Madeleine Kingsley missing person at the moment. Unfortunately, there's quite, you know, these cases, they're not rare, are they? They're not rare. But anyway, that 911 call, because we're going uh, to America for this case, this case is in Modesto, California. That 911 call was made by the stepfather of Lacey Peterson. Lacey was eight and a half months pregnant but apparently had gone out to walk her dog uh, this to me is straight away the very first strange thing because it, uh, you know any, if any of you out there any of you ladies out there who have had children i know when i was eight and a half months pregnant i could hardly walk now man go out and walk uh, uh, i only had a poodle and it was hard enough to go out and walk it but um anyway I think they had a golden retriever called Mackenzie. So, anyway, that's supposedly what she was be doing that morning and um, disappeared, vanished. How many times we've heard this word lately? Vanished, disappeared into thin air, no evidence. You know, um, people don't just vanish. When people disappear, something has happened to them one way or another. You know, whether they've taken themselves off or somebody's taken them or some harm's befallen them, people don't disappear. That is impossible, as Paul said. So we're going to talk about this case. Uh, it's quite an old case. Uh, well, it is. It's 20 years ago when it actually happened. But I think it's so, still relevant, obviously, today. We must never forget. Uh, these victims you know um, anyway I'll get into the story of telling you about Lacey and what kind of person she was etc I just want to do my usual um, housekeeping first has to be done so if you want to support my channel there are a few free ways you can do it you can just like the video subscribe you can uh, share the video all those are free ways of helping to support my channel in the sense of helping me make more videos giving me more time to make more more videos <coughs> also thank you so much to everyone who's bought the confessions of a spanish teacher book which is available on any amazon site and that can be bought 
on any Amazon site all over the world that just talks about my own experiences with stalking with uh, the reasons why I ended up coming to live in Spain because I live in Spain now even though I was born in the UK and uh, my day job as I always say is I am a Spanish teacher I do this true crime channel I enjoy doing it uh, I like to bring into um, I like to make things uh, bring into the public eye these cases and always always remembering the victims and why these things must never be forgotten their stories must never be forgotten and they must be used to help us hopefully to stop things like this happening again because it happens too often all the I, I don't just do crimes about um, husbands who murder their wives any crime be it stalking be it whatever it's connected with um, we have to you know people cannot take cannot feel that they have the right to take someone's life for whatever reason because you never have the right to take someone's life so anyway, so, but my day job, <laughs> so I, don't, I mean, it sounds strange that I do it for fun, but I sort of do, it's not fun, but it's, I do it because I enjoy doing it, and I think it's important, but my day job is, I teach Spanish, I've been a, ta a Spanish teacher for 25 years, and I have written books on learning Spanish, you can buy Break the Language Barrier, levels 1 to 5, again, on any Amazon site, just remember that it is Vicky with an I and all the links will be in description. <coughs> okay, so that's enough about me. Let's talk about Lacey. So Lacey, um, when she disappeared, uh, it was on Christmas Eve. Something, you know, a, a Mitchell Choir and Lindsay Choir. Lindsay disappeared around Christmas time. Uh, one thing I've noticed over covering tri uh, true crime sort of cases, stories, quite often is around holidays, you know, like national holidays. Quite often in America, they'll say, oh, it was Super Bowl Sunday or Saturday. Oh, sorry if I've got that wrong, but I'm not really a follower of American uh, of baseball or whatever. But they, I know there are big events, aren't they, like the FA Cup in the UK. or And, and things quite often seem to happen around these events. So it's quite strange isn't it or Christmas or you know they must bring up feelings in people or bring up conversations I don't know maybe um, that that lead to things happening it's something I'd like quite like to investigate to be honest if this, the actual statistics do more uh, crimes happen around these times but anyway so it was Christmas Eve when Lacey disappeared you know so it's a significant day and that you know it must be even worse for a family because you can't when in my as I tell you in my book uh, the sort of traumatic event happened to me it was Valentine's Day well you can never forget that it's Valentine's Day it doesn't matter how many years go by uh, and the lead up to it it's like like Christmas you know everybody be enjoying Christmas I also had another event happened at Christmas as well and it ruins these um, you know as years go by and you're trying to get back into a normal life it's impossible I mean it's bad enough you know the, the you don't forget the anniversary I'm not saying that you do forget an anniversary of a death or a traumatic event but when everybody else around you is enjoying this date because it's Christmas or because it's Valentine's Day it's something special you know every you know you're bombarded with it you you just can't escape from it and not only that everyone else is enjoying it um and looking all happy and you know whether they are or not I don't know but it's it's, it's sort of doubly traumatic I think because it's you can't escape from it ever ever so uh, my heart goes out to Lacey's family um, you know e even now after obviously many years have gone past but I'm sure it's not really that much less traumatic for them okay so Lacey she was born on the 4th of May in 1975 so she was 27 years old when she went missing um, she was apparently very lively personality she could make anybody laugh 
um, very vibrant there's lots of videos of her that have been released by the family you know personal videos that show that she is like a real bubbly beautiful uh, personality um, and you know just one of those people that you would love to be around when she went missing um, she was eight months pregnant eight and a half months pregnant with her first child sorry excuse me just have a little coffee I've been doing quite a few videos this morning so I'm a bit uh, hoarse so she was pregnant you know virtually uh, at full term I mean I think the baby was due in the following February and um, this was her first child with her husband Scott Peterson and they'd already decided to call the, the child Connor the nursery was ready etc they knew it was going to be a boy and they'd named it already or decided on a name already which was Connor so her husband Scott he was born in October 1972 so he's a couple of years older than Lacey but just a couple of years so yeah Lacey's due date was February the 10th 2003 now there's a, a lot of talk about during the pregnancy um, Scott was quite uh, he didn't seem to want to touch Lacey much you know especially as the pregnancy became more advanced he, he, he didn't want to rub her toe you know like normally men uh, you know they're just as pleased as the woman aren't they you know they're expecting a baby especially their first child you know there's a lot of excitement it's all lovely but I, I, apparently it wasn't quite like that with Scott he was quite um, didn't really want to he got involved in the you know decorating of the nursery etc and all those sort of things but as far as you know rubbing a tummy or he 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 didn't sort of go down that path you know he didn't seem comfortable now so, you know i do think this is a thing some men they they well there's various reasons they don't like their partners to be pregnant um as though most men i think are over the moon but obviously uh women put on weight when they're pregnant you know uh, obviously um but also you know they some men don't like the competition of a child you know a child is a lot of attention isn't it and some men don't like that some women don't like that you know I, it's not really a man woman thing there's something in our ge our genes are created to feel protective towards children that's how we're designed isn't it or uh, but but some people are missing those I don't know it's just some people don't have that same instinct and it said that um, it was noticed um, that Scott maybe at sometimes he wasn't quite as over enthusiastic about the baby as he maybe could have been having said that Lacey's family loves Scott you know they had no whilst before this incident happened there was no reason that they had really to believe um that he didn't love Lacey and he wasn't happy and you know so it was a complete surprise when finally um well not when the truth came out because but leading up to that they started to feel a little bit more differently about Scott I mean what would you do you know if it, it's very difficult isn't it because I think even if you did have misgivings your any member of your family be it your child be it your brother sister etc and you you had some misgivings about their partner it's very difficult isn't it to broach that subject or your friend because you you're in danger you know they're likely to protect them and think that you're just like being nasty so I think it's very difficult to express misgivings even if you do have them and then you would question wouldn't you you'd look at anything oh well yeah they're 
they're nice in this way or they're good in that way and nobody's perfect and you know I think it's impossible to see these things come in and I know that people feel guilty afterwards sometimes that they didn't spot signs but you can only spot the signs in hindsight you can't well you maybe you can spot them at the time but you, it's easy to talk them away you know it's easy to uh, dispel them and because you want your loved one to be happy and if they're happy with that person in the end you just think well it's not really any of my business uh, you know that you're likely to fall out with them or maybe even lose them if you express these misgivings so if they did have misgivings they didn't express them uh, you know at the time but I think generally it's accepted that they thought I mean this was a guy one policeman described uh, Scott as a guy who didn't have a parking ticket he'd never been in trouble with the police he'd done nothing wrong his whole life he was you know so there was no reason to suspect he would turn into what I personally consider is an absolute monster now not known at the time but in November 2002 just to mention this now because it, it becomes important later on in the story Scott was introduced to a massage therapist called Amber Frey uh, by a friend and we'll find out later that a relationship developed between Scott and Amber but it didn't come out till later so this was November the same year and Lacey went missing on Christmas Eve that same year so a couple of months later and Amber we'll hear from Amber later Amber said Scott told her he was single uh, in, and they started a romantic relationship so what happened on the 23rd of December at 8 30 in the evening approximately Lacey's mum Sharon spoke to her on the phone that was the last time she ever heard from her daughter so the next thing was she disappeared so the following day the 24th she completely disappeared Scott said he last saw her at 9 30 a.m. bear in mind this was Christmas Eve on December the 24th when he left to go fishing at Barclay Marina now another thing to bear in mind is that initially he said he'd gone to play golf because he was a keen golfer he was very good at golf apparently but initially he said he went to play golf but he changed his story later and said he went to go fishing at Barclay Marina which was something that he'd never really done before he, he'd only got his fishing license recently he bought a boat just after he met Amber he bought a boat but nobody knew he had bought that boat when it came out that he'd bought a boat uh, Lacey's family didn't know anything about it they said oh yeah he doesn't have a boat but he did have a boat and he'd bought it after he met Amber now I don't know <laughs> I mean I don't know I, I should have uh, looked it up but when did Dexter come out Dex because this is what Dexter did it wasn't it anyway let's go into the story first okay so he says he left at 9 30 as he left she was watching a cooking program Lacey was watching a cooking program on the tv eight and a half months pregnant and he said she was about to do some cleaning now they had a cleaner but apparently she was about to do some cleaning bake some cookies and take the dog out that's what he said she was going to do and he said um, he was going off uh, well golfing or fishing he changed his story around 10 30 a.m. later on that same morning uh, their neighbor Karen Servas found the golden retriever Mackenzie outside running loose and um, alone and she put the dog in the yard and closed the door 
because she didn't get up well I presume she knocked on the door or rang the bell and didn't get any answer but maybe not maybe she just put them inside the backyard and just secured the door and made sure the dog was uh, safe now when Scott returned home that evening the house was empty he says and he showered and washed his clothes because he said it had been raining um, at the uh, when he went fishing it had been raining he'd got wet and muddy so he had a shower and washed his clothes not put them in the washing basket washed his clothes now what I'm going to play you now is the message that he sent to Lacey on his way home Okay, so he sent Lacey that message as he was on his way home from fishing or golf or wherever he was going. What do you think of that? Do you think he sounds genuine on that message or do you think that was like uh, a message just to sort of throw people off, you know, that he had messaged to like that he did that on purpose? to show that he thought she was still alive at that time or she was still there at home. It, the police were immediately suspicious. Uh, some of the police, they said they thought it was not the right sort of message. Um, but anyway, they didn't know. It was all conjecture. They listened to the message. They immediately had a little bit of a, a you know, this intuition, this... The, the hunch that people in the police get, you know, at the end of the day, when you've dealt with a lot of people over years, if you're a detective, you do start to get instincts. Um, so, yeah, so he returned home that evening, to found the house empty, showered, he washed his clothes. Um, the, the house was spotless. Mm -hmm. When the police arrived, this is something to mention, and they think that because obviously he said that Lacey was just about to do some cleaning, walk the dog, bake some cookies and do some cleaning at eight and a half months pregnant. But anyway, there you go. So it wasn't Scott who reported her missing. What happened was he rang Sharon Rocha, which is um, Lacey's mum. That was her, her husband that spoke in the 911 call, though he was Lacey's stepfather. And he so um, he rang he rang her to see if like she'd heard from Lacey because he you know he didn't know where she was and didn't understand why she wasn't at home and he couldn't get hold of her. And later that evening, it was Ron, her husband, who phoned the police to report Lacey missing, as we heard right at the beginning of the video. When the police arrived at the house. Um, Lacey's keys, her wallet and her sunglasses were all in her bag, in her cupboard. So obviously wherever she'd gone, she hadn't taken anything with her. I, and again, I mean, I know when you go and walk your dog, maybe you don't take, you know, everything with you. But I certainly take my phone when I, when I, out of those things there, well, I would take my sunglasses as well, depending on the weather, obviously. But I might not take, um my purse you know right if I didn't need any money to go for a dog walk but of course I would have my keys you know because otherwise how would I get back in the house also I would have um my phone um, which I presumed her phone or it wasn't there either I don't know but uh, actually it's not mentioned in the phone so maybe a phone had disappeared so that's what I would take with me what do you take with you when you walk your dog you take the basics don't you your keys your phone you might take your purse, depends you might be going to call at the shop on the way home. Anyway, straight away the police started suspecting Scott because the house was so clean, the kitchen particularly. Um, his demeanour was immediately suspicious. I mean, this is an impression I got. You'll see some uh, videos later and photos of Scott. 
and I'll put some links in the description box where you can watch them properly, you know, in full. He was so detached, you know, his manner, it reminds me of Nicola Bully's partner. There's, when you see someone who's genuinely, like when you look at the way the mother is and even the stepfather, you know, he's not as close as the husband of his, so his pregnant wife is missing. Uh, and he's just so cool and detached and one of the policemen described him as uh, Steve McQueen cool he was so cool you know he wasn't interested in uh, joining in the search he was very distant to Lacey's family uh, when he did meet up with them because they didn't suspect him at all at first as I said earlier they thought he was a great guy but uh, he was quite distant towards them he was uh, reluctant to hug them or be actually seen with them he was more sticking with his own family he's probably guilty probably guilt that he felt um but immediately they thought his demeanor was suspicious calm distant not really interested and again changing his story because after initially saying that he'd been to play golf he then said he'd gone fishing at the marina at the barclay marina and produced a, re a receipt to show that he'd you know gone in there paid to go in there to prove that he'd actually been there so yeah initially Lace, Lacey's family had no suspicions but after this behavior you know they noticed they started to notice gradually this detached behavior and how he seemed reluctant to engage with them you know uh, and they started to feel uneasy and mum started to feel uneasy then all hell let loose because on january the 17th 2003 amber frey remember the massage therapist that had met scott in the, the the year before a couple of months before christmas saw about it all on the tv etc and recognized him and she came forward and she told it told it, the police that uh, Scott had told her two weeks before um, Lacey disappeared Scott had told her that he was a widower and he would be spending the holidays the Christmas period alone he actually told her that he was going to Paris for the holidays uh, you know to try and sort of alleviate the loneliness he felt from being a poor widower uh, bearing in mind uh, when he was saying all this to Amber Lacey hadn't even disappeared yet and he was far from a widower he was you know married with a, uh, a pregnant an eight and a half pregnant month's pregnant wife so he told her he went to Paris and he actually phoned her from the vigil that was being held in Lacey's memory as everybody was holding the vigil he phoned Amber telling her he was in Paris what a great time he was having in Paris and I'm going to play that phone call for you now Uh -huh. 
Pasquale's friends now. Well, the quality's not very good, uh, so it's difficult, but I hope you managed to hear there that he said he was at the Eiffel Tower and there were a few fireworks going off. And uh, she said, oh, I'm glad you decided to go out and uh, I can never remember your friend's name. And he said his friend was called Pasquale. Bear in mind, at this time, Amber didn't know anything about Lacey at all. Um, but he was actually at the vigil for Lacey. <laughs> You know, say so he was phoning at that vigil for Le uh, Lacey. He was phoning Amber and saying he was in Paris at the Eiffel Tower for the New Year's celebrations. I think you know. Sometimes you just think there you you cannot be surprised by people. That you know, the more you you know, you think nothing will surprise you anymore, and then people do things like this. You can never be a hundred percent certain that these people liars will tell the most outrageous liars they don't have any filter on it you know that it's like you know we all tell a few little white lies here and there normally because we don't want to hurt people normally um but a liar you know a sociopath a psychopath or who whatever they will say anything anything and it'd be the most outrageous lie and that's what makes it so difficult for other people to um to understand that because you sort of in the end you think well oh, no they wouldn't lie about that or they wouldn't say that or they wouldn't do that because you wouldn't do it but you can never underestimate what a sociopath might do or say so yeah, he was actually Modesto at the vigil for Lacey where apparently he stayed away from Lacey's family. That This is when they really started to sort of wonder why was he being so distant from them? Uh, you know, he, he, he changed towards them. They'd always loved him, you know, they'd, they'd had no reason not to love him. They thought he was a great husband and, and prospective father. So on January the 24th, due to all these misgivings that the family had been having, they withdrew public support from uh, Scott. They withdrew their public support and things started to change. So there were many searches. It's a bit like the Madeleine Kingsbury case at the moment. You know, massive searches. Where do you start? We're looking everywhere. Uh, a reward was offered and there were over 1,500 volunteers uh, to help search for Lacey and Connor. Then on April the 13th, so that's a long time after, isn't it? A long time after April the 13th. Bearing in mind Lacey went missing on Christmas Eve, so that's four months nearly, well three and a half months. Uh, a couple were work, uh, walking their dog in the San Francisco Bay uh, on the shore of the San Francisco Bay and they found the body of a late term fetus. Now I just want to warn you so for the next sort of five ten minutes or so the, it will be very nice the details of the, uh, of the body being found etc. If you want to skip this that might be better for you to do it's, you know it's quite distressing I won't not go into massive glory detail I don't do that but I just have to say the condition of the bodies because it's important I think to understand Scott Peterson and what kind of person he is uh, anyway so they found the body if you're still with me they found the body of a late term fetus it's um, uh, the umbilical cord was still attached the full result of the autopsy, uh, the results are withheld, which is probably best, uh, but nylon tape was found around its neck, quite a long section of nylon tape, and there was a significant cut on the body. Now, you know, again, without going into graphic detail, I don't know if that cut was made while it was while Connor was still inside Lacey's body, maybe a stab wound, or whether it's something that happened 
you know, I don't know, so I don't really want to speculate anyway. So there was Connor, that was uh, found to be Connor, and a day later, a day after that, the body of a recently pregnant woman was found wearing beige pants and a maternity bra, one mile away from where Connor had been um, found. This was found to be Lacey, but she had been decapitated and limbs, her limbs were missing. This man is a monster. He is the worst, kind, in my eyes, he is the worst kind of monster. You know, you can talk about serial killers who do terrible things, but you know, they do it to people that they don't even know, you know, they don't even think of them as people, I know that. Uh, they, they, I'm not saying it's right, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is what sort of a person does something like that to someone they know, someone they love, supposedly, have been married to, have been intimate with, have lived with for years, have, have, uh, have got excited about a baby coming along, and what sort of person does that to their own child as well so it's just the worst kind of monster this guy you know and you'll you'll have seen the photos of him very good looking you know you could see that you when you, if you met him especially you know around that age you'd be thinking oh he's nice you know he seems sort of sweet and he uh, he's a monster and I think it was Ted Bundy, actually, who's one of the biggest monsters of all time, who said, you know, monsters or psychopaths, they're not gibbering wrecks that come out at the full moon. You know, they're like normal people who live amongst us. And because uh, he, again, was a very charming man. But anyway. So this obviously increased the urgency of the police to investigate properly. Haven't once the bodies were found, uh, they've got a lot more to work with. They know for sure that Lacey is dead. It must have been devastating for her family. But again, as I always say, it is devastating, but it's better than not knowing. The worst thing has got to be not knowing year in, year out, you know, for the rest of your days, not knowing what's happened to your loved one. So although it's terrible, at least they know and they've been able to bring um, Lacey and Connor home and give them uh, a respectful burial. Now, strange because after Amber had gone on a record, you know, gone on and done her police uh, uh, press interview uh, saying that she knew Scott and they had been having a relationship etc and it came out about the phone call that he'd made to her on New Year's Eve claiming he was in Paris when really he was at Lacey's vigil um, they carried on in contact and in fact Scott you know turned around to it and said oh I don't blame you I'm glad it's all out in the open that we had a relationship now and he then started doing a few interviews and I'd like to show you and um, well yeah I'm going to show you a bit of this interview but there, obviously it's better for you that you watch the whole interview like you know properly but I will put the links down below but I just want and when you're listening to it who does he remind you of Answer to the same question. Did you murder your wife? No, 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 I did not. And I have absolutely nothing to do with her disappearance. And, and use the word murder, and yeah, I mean, that is a, a possibility. Um, it's not one we're ready to accept, and it creeps in my mind late at night and early in the morning. And during the day, all we can think about is the right resolution is to find her well. But as you know, increasingly, in the public, suspicion has turned on you. Yes, definitely. Did you ever hit her? Did you ever injure her? No, no. My God, no. Um, violence.
violence towards women is unapproachable. It is the most disgusting act to me. Um, and I know that uh, the suspicion has turned to me. And it's, um, it's turned to me, one, because I'm her husband. And that's a natural thing. And I've heard all the statistics on all the news shows about that being, you know, someone that, uh, a husband, ex-husband, a boyfriend, that is statistically one who would be responsible for her disappearance. And, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your question. <laughs> Did you ever hit her? Did you no, ever injure her? No, no, never. Um, I, I was answering your question because of the suspicion that it's been turned to me. Okay, I don't think we have to listen to it. As I say, I'm going to put the full um, interview, the link to the full interview in the description box so you can watch it. And uh, what do you think? Tell me what you think. I mean, it's just, I don't know. Anyway, he made that interview while they were still looking for Lacey. So it was almost as if when um, his girlfriend came out amber and, and and sort of said that he'd been having this affair he decided then that he was going to do this media blitz going he did quite a few interviews why i don't know but maybe not once it was out in the open it had been having an affair maybe he felt like he had to you know these people they're they think they're cleverer than everybody else but actually they're so stupid because uh, they come out and do these interviews like you know like they're pulling the wool over people's eyes and then get annoyed when people don't fall for their stories don't they that's the thing they come out and do the interview and then when people don't fall for it they get annoyed and cut off the media etc uh, and we've seen that haven't we so basically what happened after that obviously the police were on to him uh, they found out about this boat that he'd bought and he bought the boat after he told Amber that he was a widow and he would be spending Christmas alone uh, the holidays alone going to Paris um, so they found out about that they they found a few other bits of evidence etc and also Amber was very brave because she was still in touch with him and there was quite a few conversations went on between them that were recorded by the police and eventually the police felt they had enough to arrest him and they did so and lucky they did because they were worrying that he might be planning to um, run away and when they arrested him he, he was arrested on April the 18th 2003 he had dyed his hair blonde uh, his car was overstuffed, they described it, with various items, $15,000 in cash, survival gear, uh, camping equipment, clothes, four cell phones and two driving licenses, and more weird than and Viagra tablets. You know, I, that was what was in his car. So they do, they felt that he was on the verge of running away but he said no he was living out of his car because of all the media attention anyway they arrested him he was tried he was found guilty uh, there are some people who, who still believe that he's not guilty i am not one of them as you can see and if you want to explore that avenue you can but I'm not going to explore it in this video because I don't think it's worth exploring to be honest it's 100% certain he's guilty um, and he was actually sentenced to the death penalty but he did appeal that and it has been he, he, in two, August the 24th 2020 uh, the death uh, sentence was overturned and he was sentenced to life without parole I love the life without parole. Uh, I, I don't believe in the death sentence because I don't think it's right to kill anyone, even though I understand the sentiments behind it, especially if it's a member of your family. Um, but I don't 
understand the sort of life and it's only 13 years or 15 years life without parole that's a just sentence as far as I'm concerned uh, he took two lives if you could take two lives away from him you should be able to do that um, anyway so that's it he's in prison may he rot in prison um, you know he's not quite as good looking now as he was obviously he's, he's a bit older now but her Lacey's family uh, are lovely uh, you know you see them being interviewed now more recently they've learned obviously they haven't got over it you never get over it but they seem to have made a peace with it where they talked about Lacey freely um, and you know I've, I've I've learned again to enjoy her memory because the worst thing is I'm getting upset but he take you take away someone's memory when you because they can't think you you can't think about that person because every time you start to think about them you, th you start off thinking oh yeah remember this like when they were a child or whatever and as time goes up uh, as your thoughts go on it always ends up with the horror that it finished up so in the end you try not to think about them because thinking about them you know it's going to lead to that final place but they seem to have made peace with that where they can talk about Lacey and laugh about her and enjoy her memory and that you know because they did enjoy her for at least 26 years it's a shame they never got to enjoy their grandchild um but yeah they seem to have learned a peace with that at least and that's really the most you can hope for to learn to enjoy the memory of your loved one again so that is the story of Lacey Peterson and Scott Peterson and um, yeah he's exactly where he should be or backfired on him you know I feel for Amber as well and apparently I think there was another woman involved as well but she doesn't seem to get as much media attention you know he had another relationship as well extramarital relationship um yeah amber will always be remembered as the woman that um scott peterson got involved in and ended up murdering his wife now i hope she's made that work for her um because that's a big thing to carry around your neck isn't it you know forever everybody will know you immediately you know it's such a famous case that immediately uh, people will recognise her, will know who she is and uh, I hope she's made that work in her own favour because she helped a lot to actually put Scott Peterson exactly where he belongs. Okay, so that's that. Any, If I get any updates on the Nicola Bully case or the uh, Madeleine Kingsbury case, of course I will let you know. I um, hope there's lessons to be learnt from this case. I don't know can we learn lessons can we ever stop it we probably can never stop this happening completely but at least the awareness hopefully will make some difference somewhere along the line so until I see you again remember as always to always live and love very carefully and until I see you again may your God go with you thank you